Very few people have the experience of reading all of Paradise Lost. And book eight is one of the books that, I don't know, kind of like Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, you just never listen to it. So book eight, I mean, um, book nine is kind of the, the human climax that we've been waiting for. Book 10 takes us through that. And books 11 and 12, I mean, they have their own kind of special status. Um, but they're kind of the guidelines for Adam and Eve to enter into the world after they have to leave Eden. So in book eight, Milton, um, Milton enters into a, a contemporary cosmological um, debate. I don't really know, I don't know the extent to which this debate was really real at this point, meaning uh, Adam asks Raphael, you know, tell me about Copernicus. Um, tell me about Kepler, meaning uh, Adam asked Raphael, you know, where our world is seeming to change, that we've lived in this Ptolemaic universe, and now it seems, following Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler, that we don't anymore. We live in a, we live in a heliocentric universe. And so this is an opportunity that Milton has to, to, to discuss these things. So you wonder why is it that Milton cares? Why would he care? Why does he bother to get involved in this cosmological discussion? Why do the sciences or contemporary sciences, contemporary cosmology, it's kind of like our contemporary quantum physics, it is the cutting edge. Why does Milton put this in his poem? So um, Adam asks Raphael, um, I think, and, and let's just read the introduction here, which I think is kind of important. So spake our sire, and by his countenance seemed entering on studious thoughts abstruse, which Eve perceiving where she sat retired in seat with lowliness majestic from her seat of grace, that one who sought to wish her stay rose and went forth among her fruits and flowers to visit how they prospered bud and bloom her nursery. They had her coming sprung and touched by her fair tendons gladlier grew. Yet when she not, as not with such discourse delighted, or not capable her ear of what was high, such pleasure she reserved, Adam relating, she sole auditress, her husband, the relator she preferred before the angel, and of him to ask, chose rather. He she knew would intermix grateful digressions, and solve high dispute with conjugal caresses, from his lip not words, from his lip not words alone pleased her. Oh, when meet now such pairs in love and mutual honor joined. With goddess-like demeanor forth she went, not unattended, for on her as queen a pomp of winning graces waited still, and from about her shot darts of desire into all eyes to wish her still in sight. And Raphael now to Adam, doubt proposed, benevolent and facile, best replied facile means easy going. Wow, what a, such an interesting passage, right? Um, old MacDonald in the background there. Um, so on the one hand, the, the, there's obviously, again, Milton's um, gender hierarchy and the clear sexism. But as we've been talking about, rejecting Milton as a sexist doesn't do even, you know, uh, one quarter of the work. There's just so much about the way that Milton represents the genders that is of interest. And although we might, our takeaway might be, oh, well, he's sexist, but, but before we get there, we should try to see exactly how he's, he's representing um, the male Adam and the feminine Eve. Um, we, we see, first of all, so there is this, this contrast between Adam's studious thoughts abstruse and her, um, And, and well, this the, this picture of fecundity that describes her. She, he's again studious thoughts abstruse. Here we have prospered bud and bloom, fruits and flowers, fair tendons gladly or grew. So while Adam is off in these involved in these abstruse thoughts, it's interesting also that in the end of book one, it's it's I think the devils who are involved. They're in wandering mazes, lost. I think maybe also with thoughts abstruse. It's worth checking out there. Um, and we find out actually she's not she's not not staying because she's not capable of it. Yet when she not is not with such discourse delighted. I mean she gets, she likes it. We're not capable her ear of what was high. She's that as well. Such pleasures were reserved. Adam relating. Why would she do that? 
sole auditress, her husband, the relator she preferred before the angel, and of him to ask chose rather why. She knew would intermix grateful digressions and solve high dispute with conjugal caresses. When Adam talks to Eve, I guess when, when, when Adam is with God, he's um, involved in this abstruse thought, but when he, when he talks to Eve, he would intermix grateful digressions and solve high dispute with conjugal caresses. Here you see a, a, a here, here's thing we've seen all over done, right? The idea of the, the, the spiritual and the physical being related one to another. Um, but here it's the abstruse and the philosophical that are now being solved with conjugal caresses from his lip, not words alone pleased her, meaning more than words, also the physical. So somehow when Adam and Eve talk, there's the physical about it as well. Um, and then Milton goes on, talks about how she, he really gets both things at the same time here. Um, and from about her shot darts of desire. So this is Eve as a sexual being, right? But it gets qualified into all eyes to wish her still in sight. Meaning we may have misread it or there is the possibility of misreading Eve as this object of desire, or we see him in relationship maybe to Adam as, a, as an object of desire. But really, uh, Milton in the next line says, well, we just want her to stay. Um, okay, so I, that is, I, I think, just such a, an interesting um, introduction to this discussion of cosmology. And Milton does, for some reason, have Eve absent herself. I guess she'd be, she's present at the end of this book, and we'll have another opportunity to look at that when, um, when, she's, when she is created. So interesting that Eve, the descri descriptions of Eve, I think, frame the beginning and ending of book eight. Um, so Raphael turns to Adam to ask her, search I blame you not for heaven is as the book of God before thee set wherein to read his wondrous works and learn his seasons, hours or days or months or years. Um, so Adam, uh, Raphael says, I don't blame your curiosity, and to be sure, nature is the book of God to be read. So we have a very common idea in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance that there are two books of God, the, the, the book through God, which God reveals himself, that is the Bible, but then there's the other book, the natural world, which also can be read. On this to attain, whether heaven move or earth, heliocentric, geocentric. And then he goes on to say, imports not, it's not really that important. If thou reckon right the rest from man or angel, the great architect did wisely to conceal and not divulge his secrets to be scanned by them who ought rather admire. Interesting, right? Some things are not meant to be understood, but admired. Hmm. I think really is, is it might be, this is a message to those of us immersed in a technological and scientific culture. It's okay not to understand something. It's okay just to admire it. Or if they list to try conjecture, he is fabric of the heavens, has left to their disputes, perhaps to move his laughter at their quaint opinion wide hereafter when they come to model heaven and calculate the stars, how they will wield the mighty frame, how build and build contrive to save appearances, how gird the sphere with centrics, centric and eccentric scribbled or cycle and epicycle orb and orb. Um, so God here is, oh no, it's Raphael here is telling Adam that God one day will likely be amused by all of the theories, all of the, the models of the universe, the heavens and the earth that man has come up with. Annie Dillard, um, who writes um, short essays, she writes about the experience of an eclipse of absolutely fantastic essay. And she says, you know, when you see the eclipse, all, all your crazy theories, um, all the crazy theories that people about how, how, about the nature of the world, they kind of fall to pieces, they fall apart. Annie Dillard's a real poet, a sublime poet of nature, great, 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 great writer. Um, so here, we'll go from Annie D Dillard to the sages of the Talmud. Um, there's a, there's a story and there are several stories. One of them that I remember is a, a dispute between two Amarayim, I think Rav Yochanan, I don't remember, there are two Amarayim, um, 
These are sages from the fourth to eighth century, I think. And they are, have, they are arguing about a, um, I think the, or the reason a certain concubine was rejected by her, her lover. I have no idea. But what there is this, um, there is this back and forth. They one says, I think it's it's a hair. The other person says it's a fly, something like that. In any event, in this story, in this rabbinic story, Elijah the prophet goes to God and says. Uh, or goes to find out, well, what's, what's, or it's one of the, another, another Amara says to Elijah the prophet, go and find out what God's doing. So God goes, he goes there and he says to, um, you know, so see, he, he reports back and said, God is te- saying, such teaches my son Yochanan, such teaches my son Resh Lakish. Meaning God is there learning the Torah, as it were, of, of the two Amarai. Um, Right. There's another story that was not the one I was thinking about, but it's also related where God at the end of the story says, laughs and says, my children have defeated me, my children have defeated me. Meaning when faced with multiple interpretations of the world, there is a story in, in, in the rabbinic literature, which bears some resemblance to one of the stories that I just told, in which God really laughs in the same way that Milton's God will laugh. That is, God laughs because there's a rabbinic principle about many things, um, about arguments in general, that these and these are the words of the living God. These and these are the words of the living God means they're both true on some level. Um, and it's, a, it's an odd thing in rabbinic literature because these and these can refer to diametrically opposed perspectives and perspectives that really can't live one with the other. It's not just an aesthetic thing. You know, I like purple, you like uh, red. These and these are the words of the living God. It's like, this is kosher, and this is not kosher. These and these are the words of the living God. And in one of those stories, God really, he, he laughs because in a way, this, there's no way to find the solution. I'll think of the rabbinic story and send it to you here. Here, Milton's God is going to be laughing because to him it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference, whether it's Copernican or Ptolemaic. And in fact, I think this is, and part of it here is Raphael, the great poet of the poem, he really does stand as a figure of for Milton. Raphael, the great poet of the poem is saying, well, certain kinds of representation of the divine are not necessary. The heavens, it's not necessary. And it's interesting because Raphael stands in for Milton and he's telling Adam and Eve these stories, but he's saying, well, this, this kind of, this model, this understanding of the universe is not necessary. I mean, the other things that are necessary, um, the ethical, um, the, the, the teleological meaning, by the, what I mean by that is just the idea that, you know, we're in this story till one greater man restores. Teleology has that word telos in it, that we're heading towards some kind of ending. Um, so those things um, Raphael and Milton tell us about, but here um, um, Raphael is, is suggesting that God doesn't really care if you know these things. And he goes into quite a lot of detail here. Let's see where we pick it up out of the detail. Um, so then Raphael says, Already by thy reasoning, this I guess, who art to leave thy offspring, and supposed, supposest that bodies bright and greater should not serve the less not bright, nor heaven such journeys run, earth sitting still, when she alone receives the benefit. So you're going to say, I know, because you're such a smart guy, um, and God made you, is that it doesn't make sense for the greater to serve the lower, and it doesn't make sense for the one that's benefiting to be sitting still. And then Raphael's going to correct him. I mean, here, Raphael is totally in the Ptolemaic worldview. Consider first that great or bright infers not excellence. The earth, though in comparison of heaven so small, nor glistering, may of solid good contain more plenty, plenty than the sun that barren shines, whose virtue on itself works no effect. But in the fruitful earth, there first received his beams unactive else their vigor finds. It's like these, the earth activates the strength of the sun. So Raphael is telling Adam, you know, not so fast, just because bigger doesn't mean better. Yet not to earth are those bright luminaries officious. They're not working for earth, but to thee, earth's inhabitants. So here's a great moment where Raphael is using the Ptolemaic universe to celebrate the modern individual is kind of a paradox here. On the one hand, we would associate modernity with Copernicus, 
But here we're emphasizing human centrality. I mean, it's an older idea that goes back to the Middle Ages as well, that emphasizes human centrality. And Raphael says very particularly, it's not the earth, it's you. You're the center. And for the heaven, and for the heaven's white circuit, let it speak the maker's high magnificence who built so spacious and his line stretched out so far that man may know he dwells not on his own, not in his own, an edifice too large for him to fill, lodged in a small partition and the rest ordained for uses to his Lord best known, to his Lord best known. The swiftness of those circles, now he's describing stars, the swiftness of those circles attribute, though numberless, to his omnipotence that two corporeal substances could add speed almost spiritual, wow. So it's like these stars are circulating so fast that they have speed almost spiritual. Again, you know, at, at uh, Angel's E, in, in the end of book eight, Raphael blushes because Adam asks him about angels having sex. Me thou thinks not slow since the morning hour set out from heaven where God resides and ere midday arrived in Eden, distance inexpressible by numbers that have name. Here Milton again, kind of, I, I see Milton smiling slightly. Even the, even the numbers that we need to measure this do not have name. But this I urge, admitting motion in the heavens, to show invalid that which thee to doubt it moved. Not that I so affirm, meaning I'm not coming down one way or the other, though so it seemed to thee who has thy dwelling here on earth. It's interesting, Raphael does not, does not, he says, I'm not going to affirm one or the other, I guess because it doesn't matter. And I was asking, I wonder to what extent, and I'm pretty, I'm by, by the 1650s, right, I guess Copernicus is, is, is completely accepted. So I, I, I think this might be, a, in, in some ways, maybe this is an accommodation to poetry, meaning from your perspective on earth, I see why you would want to see things in this way, because it's very beautiful and poetic. Let's continue. I'm not so sure about that. God to remove his ways from human sense, placed heaven from earth so far that earthly sight, if, if it presume, might err in things too high and no advantage gain. So there's, there's a limit to knowledge, even for Milton, who is so interested in imparting knowledge. And so much of this poem is about the impetus for writing the poem, that is this need to teach. What if the sun, here we go, right? Here's now Raphael, what if this, what if that? What if the sun be centered to the world and other stars by his attractive virtue and their own incited dance about in various rounds? That's pretty poetic also. The, their wandering course now high, no, lo, now low, then hid progressive retrograder standing still in six thou seest. And what if seven to these the planet earth so steadfast though she seem insensibly three different motions move. But these three different motions, six planets, I think the seventh is the earth or the sun, I'm not sure, look at the notes. Um, he's getting into like real detail about Copernican ideas of three different kinds of motion. I think I looked them up. Um, um, what line is that? 130, let's see. Yeah, there's like a note like this big here, right? This middle one, right? About these three different kinds of notes and the three motions attributed to the earth by Copernicus, Copernicus, namely diurnal, annual orbital, and, and a third motion or motion in declination. So Milton knows the science here. It does seem quite clear that Galileo and Copernicus have won the day. It's interesting that Raphael still tells Adam it doesn't make a difference. Um, which else to several spheres thou must describe, must describe, move contrary with thwart obliquities, or save the sun his labor and that swift nocturnal and diurnal rum, suppose it invisible else above those stars, the wheel of day and night. What? Which needs not thy belief. If earth industrious of herself, if earth is moving of herself, fetch day traveling east. <coughs> so why does the sun rise in the morning? Is it because Earth is fetching day traveling east and with her part averse from the sun's beam meet night, her other part still luminous by his ray? So Milton here is imagining the globe turning and day and night different in day and places. What if that light sent from her through the wide transpicuous air? What is transpicuous? Transpicuous air, it sounds kind of physical though, to the terrestrial moon be as a star enlightening her by day as she by night this earth. 
reciprocal if lands be there, fields and inhabitants. Her spots thou seest as clouds, and clouds may rain, and rain produce fruits in her softened soil. For some, for some eat allotted there, and other sons perhaps with their attendant moons. Thou wilt descry communicating male and female light. I guess that's the sun and the moon. You're going to see other versions of this. There is um, a, already by the time of Paradise Lost a, 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 a significant degree of discussion about life on other planets. So there is this expanding sense of the universe. Um, Read. The, I mean, this passage bears very, very careful reading. Um, but it does seem that Milton is representing the closed world of the Ptolemaic universe in its poetry, I, I think, but also representing the Copernican universe in its poetry. and other suns perhaps with their attendant moons that will describe with this expanding universe, com communicating male and female light, right? We're not, we're not far, and th this is like a part of the discussion which, may, or, or a part of things which would make things more interesting as well, people are interested in, in looking into it is, we're not far from, from arguments later in the century about whether space is infinite or not, and, and those questions, as I said to you last time, or as we've been discussing, there's always in the 17th century a relationship between metaphysics and politics, metaphysics and aesthetics. Um, so we could be attentive to that, and this is part of that story. Um, communicating male and female light, which two great sexes animate the world, stored in each orb, perhaps with some that live. For such vast room in nature unpossessed by living soul, desert and desolate, only to shine yet scarce to contribute each orb a glimpse of light conveyed so far down to this habitable, this earth, which returns light back to them is obvious to dispute. And we don't know whether other planets have people on them. We don't know that. But whether thus these things or whether not, whether the sun predominant in heaven rise on the earth or earth rise on the sun, he from the east. It's so interesting to me though, because at the in the middle of the scientific description, we, we get this metaphor, right? Whether the sun predominant in heaven rise on the earth or earth rise on the sun, he from the east his flaming road begin or she from the west her silent court advance with inoffensive pace that spinning sleeps on her soft axle, while she paces even and bears thee soft with smooth air along. What, right, like, it's just crazy that's that, that, that passage. Who's the she here? I guess that's the earth. Or she from west her silent course advance with inoffensive pace that spinning sleeps on her soft axle, while she paces even and bears thee soft with the smooth air along, solicit my, bears these soft with the smooth air along. So here's the idea of earth um, traveling through the heavens. I, I guess as you see that I'm, I'm thinking about this question, again, about the nature of representation and what kind of representation Milton thinks are okay and what are unnecessary. God laughs at these scientific um, descriptions because he sees, I suppose, the inefficacy or the inability of, of, certain, of certain models to understand the world. By contrast, um, but with all that, both of those, by contrast, Milton does seem to be rescuing poetry, meaning here at the end of this passage, instead of Milton being satisfied just with that physical description, he does kind of go off poetically, suggesting that, well, this language, and maybe that's part of the defense of Ptolemy, is the Ptolemaic universe affords a kind of poetical language that the Newtonian universe, of course, we're not up to Newton yet, but we're getting there, that the Newtonian universe doesn't supply. That is this infinite world of space or this world of space that's threatening to become infinite and with you know, planets rolling all around and, um, and orbs. Um, Joseph Addison at the beginning of the 18th century imagines himself, it's very interesting, in a, in a Miltonic landscape. It is from Paradise Lost, and he imagines himself in that landscape. And then all of a sudden he has this like existential crisis, and he sounds like a you know, 20th century 
philosopher, like an existentialist, like Jean-Paul Sartre or Camus, just lamenting his place in this endless universe. Um, it's cool because and in that passage, Addison is clearly kind of playing with the difference between the world that Milton provides and the world that Newton provides. And I think here, almost that's almost what's happening here as well. We're getting that same sense of a contrast between this physical world that is described in physical terms and then this poetic language that it still somehow maintains here. Now, um, so then he goes on and says, leave them to God above him, serve and fear, right? Get your, get your priorities right. Or other creatures as it pleases and best, whatever place let him but dispose. Joy thou in what he gives today to thee, this paradise into, and thy fair Eve. Heaven is for thee too high to know what passes there be lowly wise, right? Thus be humble. Think only what concerns thee and thy being. Dream not of other worlds, what creatures there live in, what state, condition, or degree. Contented that thus far have been revealed, not of earth only, but of highest heaven. One more time, what creatures there live in, what state, condition, or degree contented that thus far have been revealed, not of earth only, but of highest heaven. Be content with what I already told you. Um, why does, going back to um, God's laughter here, God laughing at the, at the, um, the different, um, the different versions that people are, the different um, models that people are going to come up with in order to understand the world that he's created. Is modeling here? Yes. Um, right, here it is. Um, he, his fabric of the heavens, has left to their disputes, perhaps to move his laughter at their quaint opinions. Wide, wide, I guess, means wide of the truth. Hereafter, when they come to model heaven and calculate the stars, how they wield this and that, how build, unbuilt, contrive, saving appearances was something that they had to do. Who was in charge of that? Was that because of Galileo or Copernicus? Um, well, there's some... Right, it was a way of trying to explain away if you have certain meaning. I'll, I'll, I'll explain this to you very well right now. So why does, why does God, why does um, Milton deal with cosmology? And why does God laugh? And why, and why is, why are these, why are these quaint opinions? So we'll move to another area of thought, and that is the history of science. So the central, most famous, most important in the history of science is a philosopher named, or history of scientist named Thomas Kuhn, who wrote a book called The Something of Something Something. Let's find out what it is. Thomas Kuhn. Let's see. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Okay. So scientists hate him, but they hate his guts because they're sure that, you know, this person doesn't understand science. Um, Kuhn wanted to, and you all know Thomas Kuhn because the word paradigm and the phrase paradigm shift comes into our language because of him. That is, he looks at scientific models as paradigms. Um, he talks about the shift from an Aristotelian scientific, Aristotelian model of the cosmos. What made it change? What, what made everybody in the end reject Aristotle. So let's talk simply and schematically. I think Kuhn does use, does the talks in this manner. That um, Newton, his version of the cosmos replaced that of Aristotle. So Kuhn understands that scientific paradigms, models, the ways we see the world don't develop slowly, but that suddenly there is something called a paradigm shift. Now there may have been some, there may have been a history leading up to this paradigm shift. What makes what makes one what makes scientists take one scientific model and reject it for another? What makes Einstein, for that matter, reject Newton? How does I mean he doesn't reject everything about Newton, but certain assumptions about space and time are rejected. So why does this happen? So um, Kuhn explains that scientists who are collecting data will find data, will, will start to find stuff that doesn't fit into their models. It's kind of like when you write your paper and, you're, and you have 
Um, you have evidence that doesn't fit your hypothesis. And if you're a good writer, you, you, you save all that evidence for another paper, meaning you don't damage the hypothesis by something that's foreign to it. In, in Newton's case, in the case of science, um, they were discovering things that didn't, just didn't fit into the old paradigms. And that's the same thing with the relationship between Ptolemy and Copernicus, between the geocentric and the heliocentric. That is, at some point, you see the heavens moving in such a way, and you say, no, our old model doesn't work. And at that point, the old model doesn't work, and you shift. You change over, right? Um, um, why do scientists hate this so much, right? Well, scientists hate this so much because it implies that what they do, um, that their knowledge is dependent upon the models that they're bringing. And scientists working it within the frameworks that they work, when they're inside of that framework, and they are, and they, with great effect, they don't see really the possibility of any other. And I mean, will there be a further paradigm shift in the sciences from whatever quantum world we have? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, can't answer that question about contemporary science, but there, um, but Kuhn emphasizes the extent to which the models that we bring determine what we're able to see. They don't determine what we see, they determine what we are able to see. Meaning there still is something out there. The world of ontology is not compromised by the world of epistemology. Did I just say that? The world of being does not fall away because of knowing. Meaning just because I say I can't know things doesn't mean there isn't a world of being that is in some sense, whatever word you want to use, absolute, transcendent, whatever. Um, so Kuhn's assumption, I, I think in a way is that's what the, 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 science, the, the science is always dealing with that world, which is in some sense beyond. It domesticates that world with its models very, very, very effectively but it's never complete and different models will come along and Newton displaces Aristotle. Einstein displaces um, um, Newton. We, we've talked about, I, I sent you that, uh, the article about uh, Gadamer on play and also Freud's um, antithetical notion of the antithetical origin of primal words. I will also, if I can, send you the introduction to Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It's, a good, it's good to read. If anybody wants to, and please do let me know if you want to discuss either the, the Freud or, or the Gadamer um, uh, in our next class. So really, the paradigm shift, let's go back to saving appearances. Saving appearances, staying with, we, we have our paradigm and we have to stay with it because we don't have a better one, but we're gonna to have to make something up in order to explain why things appear as they do. Because, they, because although everything else is consistent, meaning the model really works well, where there's some other stuff that's not working well. So we have to figure out a way of saving appearances, meaning, how do they say it? Explaining the appearances. Traditional terms for the attempts of astronomers to explain the movements of the heav heavenly bodies systematically. I mean, that's true, but it's, it's kind of what's left over after you've explained it systematically, you have to kind of fetch this back into the system. And I think Milton emphasizes this here and these quaint models and quaint opinions because Milton is also advocating a certain kind of epistemological humility. I mean, you can't know certain things. You can't know certain things. And maybe, maybe by the time Milton is writing, Copernicus is established. But I don't think that undermines Milton's, and this is a question maybe we'll start with next time. Does it undermine um, Raphael's defense of the Ptolemaic universe? Why does that appear there? I suggested in, in a way that, you know, Milton, Raphael says, it, may, it seems to you like this, meaning in the world in which you inhabit, it seems to you, and maybe that's right and good, even though it's poetic. And, and the Copernican universe, even though it's, accepted uh -oh, fact, even though it's accepted fact, whatever theories we make about it, still you still have to save appearances. And in the end, God laughs at your point opinions. So here in Paradise Lost, Milton, why is Milton dealing with science? Because as always, he's dealing with ways of knowing, knowledge, what you should know, 
what you what you can know. Um, here, I, I really do think there is the there is the priority of the poetic over the scientific, because it doesn't matter in the end. And in a way, and also, but there's also uh, the injunction: focus on the right things, be lowly wise. And there is also this fear that Milton writes about of if you go too high, it may not be good for you. Right. So Milton, we've done now this. We talked about Copernicus, Ptolemy, the rabbinic sages, and um, what else did we talk about? Well. Thomas Kuhn and contemporary silent science. And, and we're, not, we're, not, we're not stuffing Kuhn into Milton. You see it there, right? You see that Milton is dealing with the same kinds of issues that will, will, will interest the historian of science in the 20th century. 